Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. I'd like to start with the territorial acknowledgement. Dalhousie University is located in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. We are all treaty people. My name is Marlo McKay, and I'm the communications coordinator for the Dalhousie Libraries, as well as the chair of Dal Reads, which is Dalhousie's Unity Reading Program. Dal Reads is, is designed to encourage people in the Dalhousie community to share their love of books, bringing the community together through the shared experience of reading the same book and taking part in programming related to the book, such as tonight's talk with Tiffany Morris. Every year, the Dal Reads Committee chooses just one book to be the Dal Reads book, and this year's book is The Marrow Thieves by Cherie Dimmeline. It's a dystopic novel set in a time when humanity has nearly destroyed the world through global warming. A great evil lurks as the indigenous people of North America are being hunted and harvested for their bone marrow, which carries the key to recovering something the rest of the population has lost, the ability to dream. In this dark world, Frenchie and his companions struggle to survive as they make their way north. The ebook is available to be borrowed through the Dalhousie Libraries, and I'll include the link to the book in the chat in just a minute. A couple of housekeeping notes before I introduce tonight's speaker. If you want to get closed captions for this event, uh, you should see somewhere on your screen a button that says CC. Um, and if you want to ask questions, there's a place on the side where you can enter your question and we'll do our best to get to all of them. If you see a question that someone else has asked that you would like to also know about, uh, please feel free to give that question a thumbs up. And that way we'll know which questions have the broadest interest in case we have to start limiting how many questions we can take. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Tiffany Morris. Tiffany is a Mi'kmaq settler poet and editor from Uktibuktuk, Halifax, Nova Scotia. She is the author of the chapbooks, Havoc in Silence, and It Came from Seca Lake, Horror Stories, Horror Poems from Sweet Valley High, both published in 2019. Her work has appeared in Room Magazine, Prairie Fire, and Augur Magazine, among others. She is currently pursuing a master's degree at Acadia University, focusing on hauntology, Indigenous horror narratives, and Indigenous futurism. Please join me in welcoming Tiffany Morris. Over to you, Tiffany. Gwe, hello, and Walalio. Thank you for having me here today. My name is Tiffany Morris. I'm a Mi'kmaq and Settler Master's student at Acadia, currently working on my thesis related to Indigenous horror narratives in the apocalypse. I'm originally from Unamagi, and my ill new family is from Eskazoni. I'm an alumna of Dell, and so happy to be working with Dell Reads, virtually sharing the space with you all. The title of my talk is Moving Through Trauma, Indigenous Futurism Survivance in the Apocalypse and the Marrow Thieves. Can I get the next slide, please? So I'm just going to read the description of the talk so you have an idea of what I'm talking about today. Then I'll move into some definitions and analysis of the Marrow Thieves. Indigenous futurism is a field of literature, art, and other expressions that roots Indigenous presence in the future, removing the stereotypical historicization of Indigenous peoples from the present. In the Marrow Thieves, the future is dystopian and apocalyptic, signaling the continuation of colonialist trauma from past to future. This talk explores how the apocalypse can create narratives of survival and survivance that situate the Marrow Thieves and other Indigenous literatures in the future. So I'm going to define what I mean by the apocalypse, trauma and dystopia, as well as survivance and hauntology, so you know what I'm talking about when I move into the analysis. Can I get the next slide, please? So when we talk about the apocalypse, a number of ideas may come to mind. Um, the end of the world through, say, zombie invasions or climate collapse or a Christian idea of divine revelation in the end of time, or most broadly, a point of crisis wherein societal collapse is imminent. I think that's kind of the broadest possible view we could give of apocalyptic thinking. So I argue that all of these concepts of the apocalypse are a different way of really, when it comes down to it, thinking about time, time coming to an end time changing or becoming, as Shakespeare said, out of joint in some way or another. This is an idea that underpins this talk, so I'll be coming back to it, but I just wanted it 
to be in everyone's mind from the beginning. Um, also helpful to define a dystopia. Uh, dystopia is an imagined state or society based on totalitarianism, oppression, and surveillance. It comes from the ancient Greek dis for bad or hard and topos place or put together an anti-utopia. And it's perhaps easy to see the link between apocalypse and dystopia and how that might create trauma for people, uh, which is in a psychological sense, a distressing event or series of distressing events that creates sustained or intense episodes of emotional dysfunction or dysregulation. It can be intergenerational and epigenetic where traumatic experiences are replicated in behavior or biology and impact multiple generations. This idea is relevant to the Marrow Thieves as well, where the trauma of the world in collapse is experienced by people through multiple generations and cultures, but so too are the keys of survival and survivance. Next slide, please. So where does Indigenous futurism come into play? Uh, according to Dr. Grace Dillon, the Anishinaabe critic who coined the term Indigenous futurism, Indigenous futurisms are not the product of a victimized people's wishful amelioration of their past, but instead a continuation of a spiritual and cultural path that remains unbroken by genocide and war. So if we think back to the idea of the apocalypse, Indigenous futurism is created within cultures that have experienced multiple apocalypses and are, from the vantage point of survival, looking to the future. And picture is the anthology um, where Dr. Grace Dillon coined the term, um, one of the first, I think, anthologies of Indigenous science fiction. Uh, can I get the next slide, please? Indigenous futurism then becomes not just a way of seeing genre, but also a way of seeing time and seeing storytelling. Indigenous futurism requires thinking beyond what might be considered inevitable or what may be imposed as inevitable from cultures outside of indigenous worldviews. Indigenous futurism says instead that other realities are not only possible, but have already continuously been present, been in existence. And it, yeah, exists in multiple modes. Um, I love this piece of artwork here that uh, takes Star Trek into an indigenous context. So can I get the next slide, please? This idea of indigenous peoples as a post-apocalyptic people was also brought forward by Anishinaabe scholar, Dr. Lawrence Gross, in post-apocalypse stress syndrome and rebuilding American Indian communities. He states that American Indians in general have seen the end of their worlds. There are no Indian cultures in the United States unaffected by the presence of Euro-Americans. Although some cultures have remained more intact than others, no Indian nation can claim to live in complete accord with its pre-contact culture. Also, there is no nation that enjoys unabridged sovereignty as it existed in the past. In effect, the old world of their ancestors has come to an end. Thus, American Indians are living in a post-apocalyptic environment. This is not to say that the worldviews that previously informed the cultures have also become defunct. And this is the crucial part why I put it in bold. Um, it simply means that American Indians are in the process of building new worlds, worlds that are true to their past history, but cognizant of present realities. And we see this building of new worlds in life as an art, um, in a mode like indigenous futurism, where survivance is written into text, into art, and into a way of seeing time. Next slide, please. So Dr. Gerald Weisner, an Anishinaabe scholar, also works with survivance. Um, I believe he may have coined the term, but I'm not 100% on that. Um, he defines survivance and elaborates that theories of survivance are elusive and imprecise by definition and in translation. The practices of survivance, however, are obvious and unmistakable in native stories. The nature of survivance creates a sense of narrative resistance to absence, literary tragedy, nihility, and victimry. Native survivance is an active sense of presence over historical absence. 
the dominance of cultural simulations and manifest manners, native survivance is a continuance of stories. And the use of the term continuance here echoes Dr. Dillon's own thinking about indigenous futurism, wherein the lines of continuation exist concurrently with and despite colonial imposition. This complicates narratives of victimry and especially the idea that that idea of nihility where the end of the world must be the end of time and the thing that overwrites the future makes it impossible. And it's interesting to me that when I hear non-Indigenous people talk about the Marrow Thieves, they're rightfully impacted by the tragedy in the narrative. I think that on some level, fiction creates a safe place for people to navigate the dark history of colonialism and conceptualize how it impacts Indigenous people into the present and future. In this case, it helps people situate residential schools in a greater context. I don't think that's probably necessary for a lot of Indigenous readers who likely are or know residential school survivors in their friend groups, family and community. I myself remember learning about residential schools at age five and was able to see the dual reality of colonialist imposition and tragedy mixed with survivance and resilience in my own family and community. And that's why I wanted to give this talk and point to the survivance narrative that also exists beyond the tragedy in this book and other Indigenous literatures. Which isn't to say, of course, that there isn't tragedy or horror in the novel. Uh, my thesis that I'm working on right now discusses that sense of horror and tragedy in the context of the eco-gothic. And I'll touch on that a little bit later in this talk uh, with how the extraction of Indigenous people's marrow mirrors the extraction of land as resource and that kind of exploitation that exists. The novel is rife with tragedy and death and it is written very impactfully. But I think that the work that it's doing, especially by the end of the novel, is to help move through the trauma, like the title of my talk. Next slide, please. So this brings us back to the idea of trauma and time. According to Dr. Stolaro, trauma devastatingly disrupts the ordinary linearity and unity of our experience of time, our sense of stretching along from the past to an open future. Experiences of emotional trauma become freeze-framed into an eternal present in which we remain forever trapped. In the region of trauma, all duration or stretching along collapses, past becomes present, and future loses all meaning other than endless repetition. Trauma, in other words, is timeless. Trauma so profoundly modifies our ordinary experience of time, the traumatized person quite literally lives in another kind of reality completely different from the one that others inhabit. This felt differentness in turn contributes to the sense of alienation and estrangement from other human beings that typically haunts the traumatized person. And I wanna bring this up here after exploring survivance because in the Marrow Thieves, the colonial state is in collapse and desperately trying to restore order. And I think that thinking about trauma is also thinking about inevitability and what becomes perceived as inevitable as a result of that thinking. And further, if people don't situate Indigenous peoples in our literatures in a sense of survivance, then tragedy and trauma become the sole narrative and the sole present, which is not, you know, reflective of reality um, in fiction or life or the Marrow Thieves. Can I get the next slide, please? So working from this idea of inevitability, I want to talk just a little bit about hauntology, capitalist realism, and colonialist realism. Jacques Derrida brought forth the idea of hauntology in Spectres of Marx in response to the collapse of the Soviet Union and thinking about the end of history. He said, each time is the event itself. A first time is a last time, altogether other, staging for the end of history. Let us call it a hauntology. This logic of haunting would not be merely larger and more powerful than an ontology or a thinking of being. It would harbor within itself eschatology and teleology themselves. 
I'm not dealing too much with Derrida, but more so with Mark Fisher's idea of hauntology and capitalist realism. So working from that framework, Mark Fisher echoes Friedrich Jameson and Slavoj Žižek in the opening chapter title of his work, It's Easier to Imagine the End of the World Than the End of Capitalism. Fisher further emphasizes that capitalist realism is the widespread sense that not only is capitalism the only viable political and economic system, but also that it is now impossible to even imagine a coherent alternative to it. And this brings us back to the perpetual present idea of trauma as well, that sense of being stuck or inevitable, inevitability. Working with Fisher's idea of capitalist realism, I bring forward the idea of colonialist realism, which is basically an extension of capitalist realism wherein colonialism is perceived as inevitable, ongoing, and continuous. And uh, the effects of colonialism continue into the present, and it's part of why a narrative like the Marrow Thieves hits us so hard. But the thing about colonialist realism is that it treats this ongoing, continuous colonialist project as inevitable and without alternative. In many settler colonial states, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of colonialism. And from that, we get nebulous, vague frameworks like reconciliation instead of actionable ideas of decolonization. Colonialist realism is also what situates Indigenous people in constant victimhood in the settler colonial imagination, rather than situating Indigenous peoples more rightfully in survivance or futurism. Can I get the next slide, please? Which brings us to the Marrow Thieves. So thank you for hanging in there with me while I went over some theory. Um, the Marrow Thieves contains within it stories about Indigenous characters inhabiting a world where in the apocalypse, not decolonized systems of Indigenous survivance and governance are the settler colonial alternative to capitalism. The universality of the apocalyptic collapse is not actually a universal end time, but a point of collapse for a system that is already in failure. It becomes the case then that the settler colonial system is stuck in that perpetual present of trauma, and the non-Indigenous characters are also focused upon this question of survival, but without a sense of survivance. Frenchie, the protagonist says, from where we were now running, looking at reality from this one point in time, it seemed as though the world had suddenly gone mad. Poisoning your own drinking water, changing the air so much the earth shook and melted and crumbled, harvesting a race for medicine. How? How could this happen? Were they that much different from us? Would we be like them if we'd had a choice? Were they like us enough to let us live? And that becomes the question and the point of crisis throughout the novel. Miguel makes the point that we all do what we can do to survive. Right now, they can chase us. And us, we can run. It may not always be this way. And who is to say what we will be capable of? I find this last statement so ominous and hopeful, which is that duality that exists throughout the novel, The Mirror of Thieves, but also in a survival and survivance scenario. Can I get the next slide, please? So dreaming becomes what the entire thing hinges upon. And we'll call back hauntology here, where, is, where it's an overlap of past and present, potential and possible, so too is the act of dreaming. To envision the future is to look to the past to look outside of a present that feels inevitable. For Mark Fisher, it is an act that requires us to listen for the relics of the future in the unactivated potentials of the past. The phrasing of relics in this context indicates a physicality of the past, a remnant or artifact of historical significance to the present. The unactivated potentials of the past indicates an ontology, hauntology, and epistemology beyond what feels inevitable in the present. In the context of Indigenous futurism, the unactivated potentials are complicated by survivance, wherein ceremony and epistemologies have continued beyond colonialist disruption. 
In The Marrow Thieves, Frenchie and the other youth characters embrace the past as a mode of survivance. As Frenchie is describing himself in the other youth characters, he states, us kids, we longed for the old timey. We wore our hair in braids to show it. We made sweat lodges out of broken branches dug back into the earth, covered over with our shirts tied together at the buttonholes. The traditional modes of ceremony and dress across indigenous cultures are kept active, present, and embraced. In addition, Minerva, the elder among the group, has language. She speaks Cree and teaches it to the other characters, including, crucially, the youth. While each character has a different relationship to the reclamation of their cultures and what survivance looks like, the survival of the group moves beyond the physical and psychological mode of survival and into spiritual and cultural survivance. Can I get the next slide, please? The role of sleep and dreaming are central to the plot of the marrow, wherein the indigenous characters are hunted for their bone marrow, where dreams and the ability to dream are stored. In the first chapter, we reach the coming to story of Frenchie. In it, the reader is given a view into the dystopian reality of the novel and how French came to join the group of indigenous people from nations and areas throughout Canada. Before he is found by this group, he is lost, injured, and nearing death. He says, the stars began to rip through the hard skin of dark like the sharp points of silver needles through velvet. I watched them appear and wink and fade and I smiled. This wasn't going to be so bad. Maybe the end is just a dream. That made me feel sorry for a minute for the others, the dreamless ones. What happened when they died? I imagined them just shutting off like factory machines at the end of a shift, functioning, purposeful, and then just out. The metaphorical hard skin of dark and the stars ripping through like sharp points of silver needles recalls work in indigenous material cultures, embroidering hides, quill work, etc. The dream here is likened to death in the afterlife, a spiritual transition that brings the dreamer into another world and mode entirely. In the novel, the non-Indigenous people have lost the ability to dream altogether and the extraction is meant to assist them in dreaming once again. The dream as a metaphor also links possibilities of conceiving the future beyond even the thrall of death. Frenchie continues, I closed my eyes just for a minute. The dream came for me right away. Later, I couldn't recall what it had been or how long I'd been asleep but when I woke, it was reluctantly. The dream coming for French makes it an active presence and embracing entity. The allure of dream is one that extends beyond remembering. Even without being able to recall it, there's a reluctance to wake to the figurative nightmare of the present, to be embodied and present within the duress of escape of danger and the loneliness of survival. In the next passage, he's rescued by the group of indigenous people who will become a figurative family as they continue north to relative safety into bases of other indigenous people. So the deleterious impact of not being able to dream links to conceptions of death for the non-dreamer, wherein capitalist reification transpires. The non-dreamer in death becomes a being objectified and embodied in capitalist and colonialist modes of being. The importance of dream becomes a practical consideration of life, death, and the future becomes tied to dreaming in a very literal and material way for the non-dreamer. And it also is a spiritually transformative thing for those that are still able to dream. Miguance, the leader of the group, relates stories about how the apocalyptic crisis came to be, explaining that diseases spread like crazy. With all the sickness and movement and death, people got sad. One of the ways the sadness came out was when they slept, they stopped being able to dream. The displacement, disease, and isolation created direct psychological distress, and the inability to dream caused greater social upheaval. In a later chapter, he continues to explain that the non-dreamers are mostly killing themselves, and so they are motivated by the need to be able to survive, and they see that solution in us. The importance of dreaming is underscored once again, where the necessity of dream is what makes psychological wholeness possible, and it is the involuntary extraction and exploitation of indigenous peoples that extends the colonialist project into the realm of death and resource extraction. The dual opposition of dreamer and non-dreamer extends beyond the realm of dreaming. It becomes how life is lived and how life ends as well. Miguans relates how the Department of Onerology came to steal and harvest the bone marrow of indigenous people. He states, it began as a rumor that they found a way to siphon the dreams right out of our bones, 
A rumor whispered every time their doctor sent us to hospitals and treatment centers never to return. The literalization and embodiment of resource extraction extends to a sense of medical institutional racism as well. Indigenous characters are coming to Western institutions for assistance with disease and injury, which does not prevent death, but hastens it. So the ability to dream is a liability, but the ability to dream is also inextricably tied to the sense of futurity, hope, and connection to story. The schools of the marrow extraction have become the new residential schools. The colonialist horrors of the past are made both present in the novel and in the future in the setting of the novel, underscoring the sense of time being out of joint. This sense of disrupted time, though, is still tied to survivance. Miglan states, we go to the schools and they leech the dreams from where our ancestors hid them in the honeycombs of slushy marrow buried in our bones. And us? Well, we join our ancestors, hoping we left enough dreams behind for the next generation to stumble across. Death, life, and the cycles of survivance become again entwined with dream. The dreams, the ability to dream, and the hope that dreaming contains for conceiving of the future resides in cultural knowledge. That is, that they will join their ancestors in an unbroken line of connection from the physical world of the living to the spirit world of the afterlife, and then to the future, where the subsequent generations have access to even more future and the dreams that are connected to it. What we have in the image of the marrow and the honeycomb is a web of interconnection. Throughout the novel, French likens trees to bones and skeletons, bringing the language of the human to the non-human, seeing the connections between living things. We see this connection also in the description of the stars puncturing through the sky and in the scene where he chooses not to shoot the moose. We see it in the kinships that form between Indigenous characters from cultures across the country, as well as at the very end where the characters encounter non-Indigenous allies who rejected colonialist realism. These webs of connection create a complete concept of reality and a complete concept of time. If you think of past, present, and future as interconnected and not necessarily linear or hi hierarchical, then you escape the tra trappings of colonialist realism that keep you in a traumatic present where time stops just because an abstract human political system stopped. Can I get the next slide, please? An important distinction between the modes of with the ability to dream stored in the marrow, the ancestral connections of the past are made present, biological, immediate, and physical. They are then passed along to subsequent generations in the same way. The marrow of indigenous peoples and the marrow thieves contains the connections of temporality, past, present, and future, to an ancestral and descendant lineage. And that's inextricably tied to culture as well. At the end of the novel, Minerva is captured by the Department of Honorology and hooked to the extraction machine. At that moment, she calls on her blood memory, her teachings, her ancestors, and short circuits the machines with song, sacrificing herself, causing an explosion in the building. The tools of survival and survivance as dream become again literal and enacted through language, as every dream Minerva had ever dreamed was in the language. It was her gift, her secret, her plan. She'd collected the dreams like bright beads on a string of nights that wound around her each day, every day, until this one. The weaponization of cultural knowledge sabotages the literal machinery of colonialism. The settler colonial project of extraction does not contain, can't contain these lineages or languages. The spiritual connection and dimension of the marrow remains accessible to the department. The relics of the future were buried not only in bone, but in language and song. The unactivated potentials of the past were made present and strategically activated to create a future outside of the project of colonialist realism and its impositions. The line writes at the very end of the Marrow Thieves that as long as there are dreamers left, there will never be want for a dream. The very act of dreaming is both survival and survivance. So that's it for this talk. Um, please feel free to ask any questions or discuss the Marrow Thieves with me, Lulaliok, and I'll hand it over to Marlo. Thank you so much, Tiffany. That was 
such an interesting talk and I feel like I want to go back and read the book now uh, another time because of so many interesting themes that you talked about. Um, I don't think that we have any questions um, that have come in yet, but uh, I'll give our attendees a moment to uh, get their thoughts together uh, with questions. But in the meantime, um, I hope you don't mind answering a few questions for me just because uh, I, I took some notes on some things you were talking about. Um, the first thing, which I know you talked about it a lot, but I was wondering if you could go over it again, is the difference between survival and survivance. I think what I got from your talk was that, you know, you kind of survivance is a state where you kind of you've moved beyond survival. Um, but I just I wondered if you could elaborate on that a bit. Sure. Um, basically, the easiest definition of survivance that I've come across and that I've kind of uh, boiled my research down to is that uh, survivance is survival but with cultural memory intact. I think that's really a crucial aspect of it to have not only this idea of thriving which is very I think um, culturally entrenched. Everybody has a different idea based on their cultural milieu of what thriving looks like, especially, you know, in late stage capitalism, it looks very different. But yeah, survivance is a mode of continuation. It, it makes that uh, linear idea of connection from the past into the future possible. It allows them all to exist simultaneously. Back to you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Tiffany. Um, I was wondering also if you could elaborate on the definition of hauntology and just talk about it more, or maybe give some examples, more further examples, I guess I should say. Sure, yeah, hauntology is, um, an interesting and kind of complex idea. Um, I think that um, the idea that Fisher has is kind of the one that resonates with me most. And it's um, this kind of idea that nothing is new. So it's kind of linked to postmodern ideas. Um, you know, this kind of moment where we're stuck in thinking about time is impossible and um, yeah and this this idea that complicates that that complicates capitalist realism and um, the idea that certain things are inevitable and inescapable it's this idea of um, the past always coming back to haunt and it extends through all of being kind of <laughs> back to you Uh, thank you, Tiffany, and I, I think that uh, kind of leads right into my next question, which which talks about the those concepts of capitalist realism and colonialist colonialist realism, which is the first time I've encountered those terms. Um, uh, I think what you said, and I, hopefully I didn't get this wrong, is that you know, like you say, the, the thought of just these scenarios just being inevitable and without alternative, and that it's easier for the people. Um, perhaps perpetuating these systems of, of capitalist and colonialist systems, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of those systems. And I thought that was such a powerful, interesting concept. Um, and also uh, the contrast between um, reconciliation and decolonization and how that fits uh, into this um, this capitalist realism and colonial colonial realism uh, kind of theories. I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so colonialist realism is something that I had the audacity to come up with myself. <laughs> uh, it just kind of seemed obvious to me as I was examining capitalist realism um, that it's very much built into these ideas and kind of their broad hegemony, how 
we accept them as part of dominant narratives without even questioning it or thinking of it. And one example that I thought of of colonialist realism was basically Louis Riel and how we tend to think about him in a non-Indigenous context. Um, you know, this, this figure, this revolutionary figure who was a leader of his people, who was executed by the state and is now hailed by that same state as a hero and how that kind of overwrites his connection to the present and contemporary indigenous resistance movements. So if the state itself, the colonialist state can reappropriate people who were in resistance to that state for their own national identity, then what becomes inevitable? If you sever that connection of resistance and make it your own, then you're absorbing colonialism further into the narrative and overwriting the indigenous narrative of resistance that continues from past to present. Um, so yeah, that was kind of the most maybe immediate because he's kind of a pop culture icon now and you know, you see him in heritage minutes and whatnot. And it's interesting to me that this, and I mean, it is a point of contention for a lot of people and there's a lot of um, debate and controversy around his inclusion in that. But I think increasingly he's accepted as a Canadian figure when I would argue that he actually isn't. It's colonialist realism that seeks to make him as such. And my, my objection to reconciliation is not that the idea of reconciliation is necessarily bad, but I think that even just a terminology like reconciliation is vague and problematic because it, it sounds like it's less about reconciling with the colonialist past on the colonizers part it makes it sound like a dual exchange of reconciliation and you know um, I don't think that that's a really fair thing to put on indigenous people to apologize in some way for how colonialism has disrupted indigenous life um, and I think that you know a more compelling phrasing would be decolonization and actually working within an actively decolonial framework and I think that there are aspects of reconciliation that try to do that, but I think that it's not as bold as the idea of decolonization. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks so much for uh, just expanding on that, Tiffany. It's really interesting ideas and uh, I thought that maybe you had coined the term uh, colonialist realism yourself, but I didn't want to say that in case I had missed uh, that you had credited to somebody with that. I think this is her own term, so thanks for clarifying that as well. Um, I see that we do have a question um, from one of our audience members. Uh, it says, um, thank you for this fascinating talk. Can you recommend other works of Indigenous futurism for interested readers? Yeah, absolutely. Is it on me? I can't tell. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. Um, Rebecca Ronorse is a wonderful writer of um, Indigenous Futurism. Um, I think she has a recent book out called Black Sun. Um, she also did Trail of Lightning. Um, there's a new anthology of Two-Spirit and Queer, Indigiqueer um, Speculative Fiction, Love After the End, that deals with Indigenous Futurism. Um, I haven't read it yet, but Darcy Little Badger, I believe her name is, um, also has a book in that field. So yeah, there's, and of course the anthology, um, Walking the Clouds, that was where Dr. Dylan coined the term. Thank you. Thanks, Tiffany. Um, I do see another question that's just come in, and it's, um, what are your biggest, wildest dreams for Indigenous futures? Do you see them in literature or media anywhere? <laughs> 
Yeah, absolutely. I would love to see Indigenous futurism become a very well-known term and mode. Um, I would love for it to be, and I, I think this is happening increasingly as Indigenous literatures and media is, um, people are increasing in their awareness and embrace of it. Um, I would love to see it just everywhere and to be a very well-known literary genre, especially. Um, yeah, and you, you see it in art. Um, there was a recent exhibition at UC Davis, I think last year, that was all indigenous futurism. You see a lot of really wonderful examples, which, which is kind of funny in the Star Wars universe of indigenous folks making Star Wars fan art and uh, really wonderful takes on Baby Yoda. And uh, I think there was a really interesting CBC article last year that explored why a lot of Indigenous people love Star Wars so much. So I'd love to see actually a very specifically Indigenous Star Wars arc of some sort. So that's something that's on my wish list, but I don't know who to talk to about it. So if you know anyone, let them know. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Tiffany. Maybe uh, maybe you could do some writing for uh, Star Wars and. <laughs> Get that story arc going because I think a lot of people would like to see that. Um, I don't see any more questions. I'll just give it another another little bit in case somebody's furiously typing away. Um, and I think I've probably I feel like I've asked you most of my questions that I had. Um, but if if no one else has any questions, um, I'm going to thank you once again for uh, being here with us tonight and for talking with us about Indigenous futurisms and survivance and ontology, all these interesting new topics to think about. Um, I've learned so much. And as I said earlier, I really feel like I have to go back and, and read the book again now thinking about these things. And I feel like a lot more things are going to jump out at me. Um, so on behalf of Dal Reads, um, I would like to thank not only Tiffany Morris, but also the production team that made tonight's event possible, Jolene Reed and Nicole Monsell, as well as Dal's video conferencing coordinator, James Wilson. Thanks also to all of you, our attendees, and for your interest and your great questions. Um, before I go, I just wanted to mention that we have one more Dal Reads event coming up this month. Um, Next Wednesday, January 27th at 3 p.m., we are presenting a talk with the author of The Marrow Thieves herself, Cherie Dimeline. So I hope that you will be able to join us for that and please bring your questions for Cherie. Um, and that's all for us. Uh, this uh, video will be up hopefully in the next day or two. So um, if you want to share it with someone who didn't have a chance to be here tonight, uh, have a look on the Dal Reads page for the video in a day or two. Uh, thanks again and good night everyone.